So thank you guys so much again for being here. You know, we started a series last week called Family Matters. And initially when, we, when you see it, you think to yourself, okay, we're going to be talking about things that affect the family. And yes, we are. But the biggest takeaway from this entire series is that hopefully we can begin to change our mindset in the Christian realm and be able to let it permeate into the rest of the world that family matters. It doesn't, you know, everybody's family looks different. There's different building blocks and foundations to it, but everybody's family is different, and every single one of those families matter. And how we live our lives as Christians within the confines of that family can actually make your family matter more to the people around you than it does now. And we started this whole thing off by talking about this idea that everything we do in our culture is measured by time. Our work week is measured by time. We, a lot of jobs determine how much they're going to compensate somebody based on the amount of time they spend working. We calculate when seasons are going to happen based on the amount of time that's passed in the year. We look to see what season is coming next by looking at a calendar or looking to see whether or not it's getting cold or not based on what time of year it is. We look at things and say, well, I don't have time to do that. I would love to do that, but I don't have time for that. In my family, we even tend to help our kids gauge how much time is going to pass or how much time is going to need to pass before something happens by equating it to whatever TV show they are currently in love with at the time or how long it'll take our oldest daughter to read her favorite book, which doesn't take long. No, seriously, a little rabbit trail here. My oldest daughter loves to read. She, she goes to the library, and she'll pick up a stack of books like that. And I'm not talking about, like, the little thin ones. I'm talking about, like, yeah, Lord of the Rings and some of those epics that are massive, and she'll read that in a week. Yeah, it's just insane. She'll pick up three or four of those. I, I love to read, but she's got it way beyond me. But, you know, we find so much amazing value in our time. We, we base what we choose to do on how much it's going to enrich us. We choose what not to do based on whether or not we think it's going to enrich us because we don't want to waste our time on something we don't really think is going to build us up or make us better or add anything to what we consider our worth and our value. A lot of us look at it and say, well, you know what? There's something I would rather do with my time, so I'm going to just do that tomorrow. The reality is what we spend our time on, what we choose to spend our time on, speaks volumes about us. Last week, we talked about the fact that the, Ameri the average American family, okay, just on average of all the families that were surveyed over the course of the year 2018, the average of all the things that they put together gives the American family out of 168 hours guaranteed over a seven-day, 24-hour period. If you do the math, it comes out to 168. The average American family has 36 and a half hours that they can devote specifically to their family. Now, that figure includes the average amount of hours worked in a week, which is roughly 34 and a half. Some families will have more than that. Some will have less than that, depending on your job. The average week of school is 34 hours a week in the state of Georgia. Homework is determined in, by this mathematical formula that takes whatever age group you are in as far as grade, first, second, third, fourth, all the way up till 12th grade, multiplied by 10 is the number of minutes of homework you should average out every week or every night, excuse me. When you take all those things into consideration and you, you figure it up, there's not much time there. This figure doesn't even account for the time that we spend in extracurricular activities like sports or clubs or um, theater if you like drama and theater. It doesn't take into account the amount of time it takes to travel to and from work or to and from school. It doesn't take into the amount of time that the average person uses on social media or socializing with their friends, when you take all of those things into consideration, it actually shrinks down to more like 12 hours a week. Why is this so important? Why are we talking about time? Why are we looking at it in th through this lens? Well, it's simple. The things that are the most important to us is the things that we choose to spend our time on. And if we want to really be able to say that family matters to us, we have to re shape and remold the way that we view the time that we have available to us. It's kind of a scary thought. But it is such a huge deal. In the very beginning, in the book of Genesis, God instituted families when he looked at Adam and Eve and said, be fruitful and multiply. You can't multiply without starting a family. 
Later on in the Old Testament, in, in, in the books of Deuteronomy and Proverbs, and in the New Testament in Ephesians, we see that parents are instructed, are, are, are told to instruct their kids, to teach them the things of God and to keep it constantly in front of them, whether they're sitting down or whether they're standing, going out, coming in. That's the role. That's what we're supposed to be doing as a family. It's so important. And then back in Deuteronomy again, in Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 16, we see the children are told to honor and obey their parents so that they can live a long life life in the land that God is about to give them. Why? Because let's be honest, parents, when, you're, when your kids disrespect you and, and are disobedient, you want to kill them. God knew in advance what our mindset was going to be. So he said, listen, kids, do yourselves a favor. Obey and honor your parents. And then in the book of Psalms, we see this thing that is, in, in, my, in, in my estimation, in my personal opinion, one of the most powerful images that we see in Scripture of how vital the family is. In Psalm 127, verses 3 and 5, it says, Like arrows in the hands of a mighty warrior are children's in one's youth. Blessed is the man whose quiver is full. You know, our families are launching pads for warriors for Christ that we're going to send out into the world. That's why it's so Important. The family unit over the last several years has taken a hit. We see families spending less and less time together. The average meal in an American home, if it happens at home, is only about 30 minutes. And even then, half of that is spent eating with complete and utter silence. There's more and more families that are broken than ever before this year. More and more families being ripped apart by divorce more and more lack of respect for authority and for parents in general. Christian families even are starting to look more and more and more like the statistics. We need, not, we don't need it's not even just have to, we need to rejuvenate what the Christian family is supposed to look like. We need to breathe fresh life into it so we can pick it back up. Why? Because like we said last week, your family is the greatest tool that you have available to you. Your family, when it comes to reaching the people around you, reaching your community, and changing the world that you live in, and your sphere of influence, your family is the greatest tool available to you. And it's hard for us to wrap our heads around that because we look at it and we go, well, okay, great. You said that last week, but I still, all week long, I've had this question in my mind. How am I supposed to do that? How in the world am I supposed to rejuvenate the family? How am I so what, what does that look like? Well, we have to build a foundation. You can't build anything that's going to last without a foundation. You can't put up any kind of building, any kind of anything without laying a foundation first, without laying a foundation first, but you have to understand that foundation in order for it to help make you stronger. Now, I'm going to read a, a, a passage of scripture. I'm just going to read it to you, okay? This is not going to be on the screen, okay? I want all of you, whether you're watching at home, whether you're in this room, I want all of you to close your eyes and listen to this because this is what we have been told that the foundation of our home looks like. An excellent wife who can find. She's far more precious than jewels. The heart of her husband trusts in her, and he will have no lack of gain. She does him good and not harm all the days of her life. She seeks wool and flax and works with willing hands. She's like the ships of the merchant. She brings her food from afar. She rises while it is yet night and provides food for her household and portions for her maidens. She considers a field and buys it. With the fruit of her hands, she plants a vineyard. She dresses herself with strength and makes her arms strong. She perceives that the merchandise is profitable. Her lamp does not go out at night. She puts her hands to the distaff, and her hands hold the spindle. She opens her hands to the poor and reaches out her hands to the needy. She's not afraid of snow for her household, for all the household are clothed in scarlet. She makes bed coverings for herself. Her clothing is fine linen and purple. Her husband is known in the gates when he sits among the elders of the land. She makes linen garments and sells them. She delivers sashes to the merchant. Strength and dignity are her clothing, and she laughs at the time to come. She opens her mouth with wisdom, and the teaching of kindness is on her tongue. 
She looks well to the ways of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness. Her children rise up and call her blessed. Her husband also, and he praises her. Many women have done excellently, but you, you surpass them all. Her charm is deceitful and beauty is vain. But a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. How many of you have ever heard that passage of scripture before? If you've spent any time in the church whatsoever, you've heard that passage of scripture many, many, many times. And you've heard it on Mother's Day. You've heard it said over and over and over again. Ladies, this is what you're supposed to be. You're supposed to be this, this woman who is late to bed, early to rise, out working with your hands and making things for your family and making your own clothes and making all these things for your family and making sure your family is hearty and fed. And you look at that and you see it and you're like, okay, well, uh, hmm. It is an absolutely gorgeous picture. It paints such a beautiful picture. And listen, for me as a husband and as a father, man, the, the fact that, that my wife could be the kind of woman that when people see me coming that they would go, hey, that's Raquel's husband. Or look at them, hey, isn't Raquel his wife? Man, that woman, he is a lucky man. There's not a woman in the world that doesn't want to walk down the street and have such a solid, strong reputation that the people that see her husband coming say, that is one lucky man right there. That man, his wife, I wish I could find one like her right? That's what, that's what all of us want. I want people to look at my wife and go, man, she's what every wife should be. I want them to look at me and be, I know this, is, this sounds horrible, I want them to be jealous. I do. I want them to look at me, man, he, his wife, man, I want that. And ladies, let's be honest, you want people to look at you and say, that is a woman of character and integrity. And she is an amazingly hard worker. Right? But there's, there's, it's a great picture and it's a great measuring stick to strive to, but the problem is this. People like me have let you down. We've let you down. And, and, and here's what I mean by that. We've told you what you should be. We've told you, you should be this woman whose children will rise and call her blessed and whose husband will say, there is no one like you. Anywhere. And mean it in a good way. But none of us have really gone into telling you how to get there and what it looks like in a practical sense. We've just said, here's what you should be. Now go to it. That's what we've done. And, 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 we, and, and we've, we've left you with these questions of, of, okay, well, great, but now what? It's not like there's a how-to guide for to, to become a, a Proverbs 31 woman that I can go to the, to the store and buy. And yes, there are, there are different books you can read that go into, but we shouldn't have put you in a place where you had to go do that. We should have laid it out in front of you and said, okay, here's the measuring stick. Here's what, saw, here's what actually King Lemuel says you can be and what is an amazing thing for a woman to be. Now, here's what it looks like. In that sense, we've, left you, we, we've let you down. It's like I've said, but like we already said, if you don't have a foundation put in place, you'll never, ever, ever have anything that will stand if you don't know what the foundation looks like. In our family, we like to play card games. We've gotten to where with our, our girls, especially now that our youngest is getting old enough to really be able to understand how some of them work, we can start playing games together as a family, games like, like Uno and, and even stuff like Phase 10 and different, different card games. We play a lot. We play, my, Micah loves to play Go, Go Fish. Oh, my goodness. I've never played Go Fish as much in, the last, in my entire life as I have in the last year. 
But she, before, what happened is we would play cards, and she would just make it up as she went. She would say, hey, let's play Go Fish. And she would say, okay, here's your card. Now give it back because I need it. And she would look at it and say, okay, well, I need this card, so I'm just going to pull it from over here. There was nothing to build it off of. You cannot walk forward in anything successfully if you don't have a foundation to build on. It's not possible. It will look successful. But just like the passage of scripture that Blake read earlier, when the right set of circumstances come, the thing that you have worked so hard to build up will crumble and fall because there's no foundation to it. For as long as I've lived, I have watched the church say, ladies, be this, be this, be this, be this. But they've never really come back and said, here's what you need to do. Here is how you do it. If you have a Bible, I want to ask you to turn to the book of Titus. We're going to go to Titus chapter 2, okay? If you don't have a Bible, don't worry. It's going to be up on the screen so you can kind of follow along. But this is one of those things where it actually, this passage of Scripture actually starts off talking to the men in the church. So I'm kind of jumping, the, jumping over something real quick because I know I can be a little bit more uh, blunt with my brothers because I am one. So, but ladies, there is so much power and truth written in this, this, these few verses here, okay? So here, we're going to tear this apart a little bit and look at some of this to see exactly what this looks like, okay? Titus chapter 2, verses 1 through 5 starts off as this, but as for you, teach what accords with sound doctrine. Older men are to be sober-minded, dignified, self-controlled, sound in faith, in love and in steadfastness, okay? And then, ladies, here's where we kind of kick in here. Older women, likewise, are to be reverent in behavior, not slanderers or slaves to much wine. Now, let, let's stop right here for a second, okay? I, I want, there, there's something in here that, that's kind of misleading a little bit if you don't really understand what the culture is, okay? In this verse, in this passage of Scripture, you see two different groups of women talked about, older women and younger women. Okay, well, what's the dividing line? Are younger women just the ones who are under the age of 50, under the age of 60? Are the older women only the ones that are in their 70s or older? No. Younger women are, is, 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 refers to any woman who can still bear children. Older women in this culture refer to the, the, the women who could no longer bear children. So why then is it starting off here by saying older, older women just like these other things, you are this. This is what you're supposed to be. Well, simple. A woman who can't bear any more children doesn't have children at home to teach. So they're required to do something a little bit different. Okay, it starts off by saying you, you, are, you are to be reverent in behavior. Okay? There, there's, <laughs> this is kind of those, one of those things here. This... The word that they use there for reverent is actually the same word that they use for priest. And behavior, obviously, is the way that we do anything. Ladies, Paul is sitting here and he's writing this and he's saying, listen, Titus, here's what I want you to teach, teach these women. He said, I want them to understand that they are supposed to live a lifestyle that mirrors what a priest would live. You should live a lifestyle that when people see you coming, that they have the same reverence and respect for you that they do for a priest. I get it. This is a really, really high calling. And we look at it and say, okay, well, what does, what does that mean? Well, he follows it up with this, not slanderers. The word they use here for slander you know, is kind of a weird word. It actually translates back to diabolos, which is the same word that we get diablo from or devil from. When we talk about slander, we talk about the words that we use. And obviously the first thing in our mind when we talk about anything to do with the tongue and people talking about slander, we talk about gossip. That's where our brain runs to. But this is so much deeper than just gossip. It's not, about, it's not just about gossiping. It's not just about sitting around talking to people and saying, oh, let me tell you what happened. 
No. This falls right in line with being reverent in behavior. Because if you're reverent in behavior, it, it calls attention not towards you, but turns attention away from you and back to the Father because your life is one that looks like living worship. And if you're living a life of living worship, you don't have time to gossip or to undermine or to tear down. You say, no, listen, your words, the words that you use, these words should be the words that come out of your mouth that are so rooted in God that it, drops, it draws people into what you're saying for them to see the Father in a new light. The words that you use should be words that build up. They should be words of, of, of worship and teaching. See, slander itself, whether it's malicious words, whether it's gossip, whether it's words that are meant in jest that end up tearing things down. You know, Jesus said it this way. He said, you, you, you've heard it said, don't commit murder. But I tell you the truth, if any of you even call someone a fool, you're guilty of murder. That's slander. The tongue is referred to over and over as something that brings both life and death. When we use our words to bring life, it does something amazing. But when we use it for slander, it divides the body. It divides the church body. It does. And it tears down the family. It divides. And it begins to even tear down the ministry that Christ has called us to on this earth. So what are we supposed to do with our tongues then? We're, we're, here we're reading, okay, you know, be reverent in behavior, live your life in, a, in such a way that it turns focus off of you back to the Father because you're, you're, you're living your life chasing after something pure and you're not, losing, you're not using your words to tear down but to build up and bring together what is it? So, okay, then fine. What are we supposed to do with our tongue? Well, it starts off in the very next thing. It says this. It says they're to teach what is good. And so train the young women to love their husbands and children. You're called to teach what is good. And in teaching what is good, to train the young women to love their husbands and their children. Why is this in there? What is this whole, you know, oh, they're married. They love their husband. They have children. They love their husband. They, they love their children. Well, okay, let's, let's take a step back. Most of the women in this particular region it wasn't like, a, like we think of marriage today. We go out and we see someone and we see a woman or we see a man and, and we look at him and go, thum, 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 thum. And our hearts go a little bit pitter patter and it skips a couple of beats and our, we can't catch our breath and we see hearts spinning around our head and Cupid, we, oh, Cupid shot me with his arrow. That's not the way it worked here. In this culture, it was, okay, how much money do you have? How much money do you have? Okay, well, you've got more money for my family, so you're going to get to marry my daughter. It was an arranged thing where there wasn't really much say in it. It was more of a business transaction. And so when these, these, these things start unfolding and you start seeing the ministry of Christ and the message of Christ spread into these other areas, there was no concept of romantic love there because it was all business transaction. Very, very rarely was there an emotional attachment. Now, yes, it may eventually grow into that. But here you're talking about young women. Okay? Here he's saying, listen, you ladies that are older, you, you've watched this unfold. Some of you, you you've learned through this. You, you've lived this. You have watched all of this unfold. You were in their shoes. Now teach them. Teach them how to love. 
that man that they were most likely forced to marry. Something else interesting here. The word that's used for love right there, it's not eros, it's not the erotic love, it's not the emotional love. And it's not even agape or agapete, the, the unconditional love. The word that's used there is philos. How many of you have ever heard of Philadelphia? The city of what? Brotherly love. That's the type of love they're talking about here. He's not even saying, listen, I want you to teach them how to romantically love their husband. I want you to teach them. No, no, no. He says, I want you to teach them what it looks like to love that person this way. Because when you love them this way, maybe, 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 just maybe, it'll grow into something else. Because if you can't even love them like a brother, you're never going to be able to show them what it looks like for Christ to love them. You've got to start somewhere. It says to love their husbands and their children. Now, let's think about this for a second. Why in the world would I want to love my children this way? Well, if we don't love our children this way, it makes for a very unpleasant home. Because you can't have authority without relationship. Think about that for a second. You cannot have authority without relationship. When was the last time you had someone come to you that doesn't know anything about you and tell you you were going to do something? They ordered you to do it. What was your first response? <laughs> you got to be kidding. I don't know you. You don't know me. This is the thing. Paul says, Titus, teach them to have not just this over-the-top emotional relationship, but to have one that connects on a friendship level as well. Because without it, there's so much heartache coming. And he goes on from here and he says, not, not just to love their husbands and children, but to be self-controlled, pure, working at home, kind, submissive to their own husbands, that the word of God may not be reviled. This is the key. This is the foundation. This is where the Proverbs 31 woman comes from. When the people who have been through it before begin to teach and mentor those that are coming up how to be self-controlled and how to be pure in thought, how to take care of a home, this is not, listen, when you read that working at home, it doesn't mean what we think it does. It means literally to take care of your home. When we train how to take care of our home and what it looks like to be submissive to your husband, and again, this is not a, my husband is the head of me and I will never speak up. No. No. That means that you yield to his spiritual leadership. As long as he is living a life that is chasing after God. Why does it say to do it so that the word of God may not be reviled? If we profess to be Christians, if we profess to be Christ followers, the things that we see happening in our world around us, they all come back to a failure and a breakdown in the family. So why did we start with the women instead of going to the men? Think about this. How many of you have ever heard the phrase mama's boy? Anybody? 
most of what we as men learn about how to be kind and compassionate and how to love others comes mostly from our mother. The emotional aspect of our lives, scientists have proven, we learn from our mothers because they tend to have a better grasp on it than men, let's be honest, we don't think emotionally. We don't look at things through emotion. We look at them through reaction. This is why this is so important. Ladies, this is why it is so incredibly important for you to understand this and for you to grasp this. Because without you, without you leaning into the generations that come behind you, without you leaning into the generations behind you like maybe you didn't have leaning into you, you can help to reshape the foundations of the Christian family. Because you have kids that are coming up behind you, boys and girls, that need to be taught what it looks like to love and to show compassion and kindness. And to be shown what it looks like to live a life of worship. So how do you do it? I mean, it seems like an awful lot of stuff, right? Live a godly example. Live a godly life. Speak godly words and kindness and encouragement. Live a life of self-control. Be friends with your husband. Yeah, it is a lot. But if you really look at what's happening in this passage of Scripture, there's something hidden in there that we miss. Because even now, as I'm talking, you're going, oh my gosh, you're putting so much on top of me. No. Because hidden deep inside of this that we overlook is the fact that being a godly woman 100% requires help. It requires help. Being a godly woman requires you to lean into people. Either way, leaning into people who have more experience and wisdom than you or leaning backwards into the people that you are trying to help bring along and mentor. This one truth is at the heartbeat of all of this. The church, in my opinion, has done a terrible job of encouraging women to mentor each other and to have relationships with those that are younger than them and to encourage them to be more than what they are. We're great about telling you, we want you to be this, now go be it. But not helping you to see that you can't be that without help. You can't be that alone. In order for you to be a godly old, older woman, according to this, ladies, you've got to be pouring into somebody younger than you. And helping them to see the things of God that you have learned over the years. How to be a wife, how to be a mother. How to move past the things that other people want you to say and do and hear. And how to combat those things. It's about relationship. When an older woman comes alongside of a younger woman, things change. People who are discouraged fail. People who are encouraged succeed. People who walk through life alone, they stumble. They fall flat on their face. But people who are mentored learn. probably the most powerful one of all, people who are discipled turn around and disciple others. See, ladies, when you begin to disciple and mentor the ones that are coming behind you, they turn around and then disciple the ones in their home. 
and they mentor the ones in their home. And the family unit begins to shift and rotate until it begins to center back on what God intended for it to be. A place where arrows are formed and sharpened. A place where children begin to see the word of God lived out in such a way that it changes their lives and causes them to live it out and change the lives of the people around them. Now I know this thing sounds so unbelievably hard, but you don't understand. I have, I have all this stuff going on in my life. I agree. We're all busy. We've already looked at the numbers. By the time you take in every possible thing you could be doing, you have roughly 12 hours that you can spend with your family. That gives you 12 hours each week. 12 waking hours, depending on how long you sleep during the week, that you have that you can absolutely pour into your family. That you can maximize your influence. The reality is, we tend to choose the things that are, mo that are mo most important to us. And the sad thing is, is, our culture has bred out of us the fact that our family matters. And we start making it up as we go along. So what do we do? We have to shift our focus and quit focusing here on what happens. We have to shift our eyes higher because our families have a higher purpose. Each of us has a higher purpose than just living here and existing. And until we embrace that, absolutely nothing will change. You ladies that are, that are biblically, culturally speaking, older women, you have been told for so long by culture that you're done. You have nothing to add. False. You have more worth and value based in scripture than you understand. You younger ladies, the ones who already have kids or maybe have kids on the way or maybe are still young enough that kids are on your mind but you're not there yet. You don't know it all. You need to lean into the older ladies that have lived, that have learned from their mistakes and can help you keep from making the same mistakes. But until you set your eyes higher on a higher purpose, a higher goal, a higher mission, history is doomed to repeat itself. You older lady, the older ladies, you will continue to pull back because you will continue to believe that you have no value. Younger ladies, you will continue to push away because you will continue to believe that there's no value there. When in truth, if you really want to be a godly woman, you need help. The things that the older ladies can teach you, there's only one place you can really learn them. And that's in having a relationship with them. That is how God makes godly women. So what does that mean for us today? Pretty simple. It's a simple thing but a very hard thing. Seek each other out. Seek each other out. It's out of your comfort zone. I get it. But if you believe your family matters and that this family matters, you don't have a choice.
I, want, I really do. I want to encourage you. Spend some time this week praying and saying, God, who is it? Who is it that you want me to learn from? Who is it that you want me to share my wisdom with? And then sit back and listen. Because you already know that it's God's will that it happen. And we pray anything according to his will. He does it. <laughs> Becoming a godly woman can't be done on your own. Not really. It requires help. Father, thank you. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for challenging us and pushing us. God, I thank you so much that you have placed women in our lives, whether we're men, whether we're women, that are godly examples of what it looks like to love you and to be a mother and to be a, even a sister and a daughter. Father, I pray this morning that every single woman in this room, whether they're an older woman or a younger woman, God, I pray that you would challenge them to not just settle for where they are now. Father, I pray that they would become disciples and disciple makers. I pray that you would use them to begin to shift and rebuild the foundations of what we call family. Help us to shift our focus to higher things. Father, I pray that you would become more important to us in regards to our family than anything else. In Jesus' holy name, amen.